I'd invite you to think about some of the concrete practices that make up what you consider to be the most important things in life. Like, not having family. Having family is important. But think about the concrete practices, the habits that make up how your family does family. Uh, is it the meals together? Is it the having a certain dish that's been passed down, grandma's, that, that grandma's slaw, or, or a certain dessert? My, my family crammed them in brownies, right? And um, not just like the importance of like family, but the other habits, the other practices that make up what is good and just the best in life. Is it uh, singing with the Monroe City Singers or playing with the Shelby County Community Band if, if music matters a lot? Um, getting to fish in the pond you grew up fishing with, uh, with others, with your friends? Is it the, the satisfaction of, of crafting something in your hands and finishing and saying, ah, this like, whatever it is. I'd invite you to think of a couple, two or three things, right? The best things that, that are just the good things in life. Cook, for me, it's probably going to involve cooking. Like it is cooking, uh, my daughter and I cook together once a week. And that is just one of the most important things is to cook with family. For me, that's what I'm thinking about. And playing with, with uh, Shelby County Community Band and meals together with my family. Like I'm, concrete practices. Okay. I'm going to guess that those th couple things weave together both sides of what it means to be human. What we read in the, ver in the first verses of the Bible in Genesis, I come back to this often, it informs so much about how I think, is that humanity is made as God takes Adama, dirt, stuff, the stuff of creation, the, the ground, right, and breathes into it ruach, which is the wind, the spirit of God, and so that we are, by our very nature, we are embodied. We have bodies. We are made of, like, stuff, right? And, and that stuff is full of what we, what we can touch, is full of what we can't touch. The spirit, the wind, the breath that God breathes into us, the soul, right? Um, and, and so that is, the, the best things in life are rooted in in both, right? Music is, is not the abstract. Music is created by, by the, the actual touching the strings or holding the horn or playing the keys of, of the piano. The community that we gather around, I can't touch community but but because that's sort of amorphous, you can't touch it, but it is mediated through an embodied practice of sitting down with someone for coffee on a, on a regular basis as a practical embodied habit. That, that, that is the connection. What is truly good is a, connect, is a combination of what we can touch and what we cannot. That reflects who we are, how we were made. So hold on to this idea, because we need to change gears dramatically. This is a sermon in three very distinct phases. That was phase one, here's phase two. If you go back over a century, one of the real challenges of early gas-powered engines was a phenomenon called knocking. Uh, this may reveal the limits of my understanding of, of mechanics, but it is my understanding of, of when uh, a gas combustion engine works. You have an enclosed space. In that space, you put some gas, some air, and you compress it so that when a spark from a spark plug ignites into that space, the, uh, the ignition of the gas and the oxygen uh, push push against that compression and pushes the cylinder up, and that is captured by the camshaft, and et cetera. Um, the higher the pressure, the more force you can get from the ignition. The more force, the more force you're extracting from the, the gasoline, the, the more efficient the engine. So you, you want to have as much pressure as possible. However, if you put too much pressure on gasoline, uh, what can happen is called knocking. When impurities in the gasoline ignite before the spark plug hits, and so the, there's, a, there's a, a rhythm to it. This 
piston kicks off and then you have multiple pistons, multiple cylinders in an engine, and they're all supposed to go off in a certain order for the engine to run smoothly. If you put the gas and oxygen mixture under pressure and the pressure ignites the mixture before the spark plug uh, puts the spark into it when it's supposed to, uh, it forces it unexpectedly to, and it knocks, it forces the engine sort of out of rhythm. Um, and this is a problem. It's not good for an engine. We are used to engines that run for just ever. Like we have a Camry with 238,000 miles on it. And as far as I can tell, it's, it's broken in and it's still good to go for plenty more, which I am very thankful for. But that was not the case with early engines. You're looking at a lifespan, the lifespan of an engine was significantly impacted by this, this knocking. Um, so GM needs to solve this problem. And there's a fellow named Thomas Midgley, finds out that if you add a form of lead uh, to the gasoline as an additive, the knocking is, uh, doesn't happen. It, it increases the octane rating of the gas. And uh, they don't call it leaded gas. At first they call it ethyl gas uh, because that was part of the, the structure of the gas. It's, there's an ethyl compound in the gas. So, um, and ethyl is a lady's name. That must be safe. Ethyl gas. Why, why would that be a problem? And it works really well. It does exactly what it's intended to do. Engines run a lot better. They no knocking. Um, and we live in a day when engines have become crazily powerful. How powerful can a truck really be before it's overkill? Um, but back then, a century ago, like this was really important for the continued development of the engine, increased efficiency. That's how uh, it was narrated. That's the story. It sounds wonderful, except if you put lead in the air, it damages uh, people, it da especially children. It damages the front frontal cortex of developing brains, and, and uh, especially boys, and uh, they end up being more violent. And so what happens is, uh, in, later in the 20th century, leaded gas is outlawed. And whenever that happens in a country, 15 to 17 years later, violent crime drops off dramatically. There, there's just this very significant drop off. The last country to get rid of uh, leaded gas was Algeria, and it happened in 2021. And, and so we're still in the, the years before uh, Algeria gets it, the benefit of getting rid of the last of its leaded gas. Uh, the, the, not the drop in, um, in violence in that community. Uh, and it, it's just this natural experiment. Like whenever a nation would stop using leaded gas, 15 years later, crime rates would go down. Here are your very fun facts about leaded gas that uh, before we move on to phase three, uh, General Motors knew that ethanol would do the same thing as lead in gas, but they couldn't patent ethanol. So they went with the leaded gas. Not impressed by that. Uh, Midgley, the guy who invented the leaded gas, also invented the use of CFCs for refrigeration. He has been called the one-man environmental disaster. Um, he couldn't actually go to the first sale of leaded gas because he was in the hospital from severe lead poisoning. Uh, so there, there's your random fun facts. Okay, third phase of this sermon. Let's talk about another technology. Cell phones. Cell phones have solved a lot of problems for people. I'm I mean, for me, it's solved the problem of having hey, to carry a video camera. I'm recording this sermon on a cell phone. Uh, it solves uh, the problem of always having a camera with you. You can do your banking on it, uh, navigation, GPS, uh, music, news, email. You can do your shopping. I can do my reading on a Kindle. Uh, I pay for my parking with a parking app when I'm in downtown Columbia. Cell phones, I was at the grocery store and someone just paid for their groceries at CNR with their phone instead of pulling out a, a wallet. Like, cell phones solve so many problems for us. Uh, and, and they're baked into modern life in ways that still surprise me. My family, we sat down at a restaurant, a newer restaurant when we were on vacation this year. And there was a QR code in, in the middle of, of the table. And what we didn't realize is that is not just how you saw the menu, that's how you ordered the food. And no one was gonna to come to your table until you scanned the QR code and said, I'm here and this is what I want. It was, uh, yeah, technology, it moves fast. Um, and so what's the challenge? Like obviously, I've just talked about leaded gas. We're gonna talk about a challenge here. Uh, 
In Matthew 6, Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, is healthy. Right? But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The way that seeing was understood, that's uh, Matthew 6. Uh, the way that seeing was understood in the first century is when you look at something, you're sort of like taking a piece of that into yourself to figure out what it is. Like I'm looking at a pew right now, so like if I look at a pew, the way my eye works is it take, like takes something pew-ishness into my eyes so my brain can figure out, oh, that's a pew. And so as you take things into your body, into your mind, it shapes who you are. And, and so we understand how the eye works a bit differently now, but it actually really does get at something profoundly true. What we fill our brains up with, from what we see, what we look at, it shapes who we are. It shapes how we think. The term for this is uh, neuronal plasticity. Like we are constantly rewiring our own brains with how we, what we put into our minds through what we, we look at. And so at what we look at, let me tell you a trend. Uh, we started looking at s smartphones a lot more in the 20 teens. A up till that point, Mental health in America had been getting, getting better steadily since the 1970s. 1950s, it got better from 1950s to 1970s. It got a little bit worse in the 1970s. And then from the 1970s on, we've been on a downward trend for less and less mental illness until we hit 2012, 2013. That was a tipping point for mental health in teens. And since that moment in 2012, 2013, teens in America Anxiety, depression, uh, rates of suicide attempts, uh, eating disorders have just spiked. Like, it, it's, a, it's the hockey stick look on the, the graph, going down, going down, going down, and then it goes dramatically upwards in ways that are, are really rather scary. And, and so the comparison with leaded gas is unfortunately accurate. Uh, what we're seeing is what you were putting into our eyes 2012 was the, the break point at which smartphones, we go from flip phones all over the place to smartphones all over the place. What we're putting into our, our eyes uh, really starts dramatically shaping our, our children, our teens. And so for leaded gas, it more dramatically impacted uh, teenage boys. And for smartphones, it is more dramatically impacting teenage girls. It impacts both, but there is a, a skew in the data. So what's happening? What is the actual challenge? What's the problem? The way that led, it, it changed the way that the brain was wired, right? What social media does, because that's the challenge. It's social media is what ends up happening, because you have smartphones on you all the time, you can have social media with you all the time. And what social media does is it changes not how our brains are wired, it changes what the wiring is, is doing, right? What, what, what are we thinking about? And so what is happening is instead of being uh, childhood is changing so that instead of being involved with in person a small group of friends with whom people can play and learn and grow up together what we're seeing is that childhood is shifting so that social media connects us to large groups of people with very little or no connection in person and yet it is the social media has very little barrier to critique right and so we can get critique from all sides. And for someone like myself who is fully grown, if someone critiques me online, I'm slightly annoyed, but like, you know what, I catch flack online, I consider that life. I have an opinion online once a week. I'm kind of used to getting told I'm wrong. It happens. That doesn't, that doesn't work the same for teenagers. It doesn't work the same for children. Uh, and so uh, it's far riskier. Right, because we put yourself online and everyone can take a swing at you and, and sometimes that's what happens. Whereas growing up with a group of people that are in person, you can take small risks together. You can learn what you can talk about, what you can't talk about, how you can, how you can joke, what you can't joke about. Like you can make a joke that's inappropriate and learn, oh, that way of joking with people is inappropriate. I hurt my friend's feelings. I will now apologize. And you figure out how to apologize and work out disagreements. That's not what happens online, though. Online, when you make a joke, and it's an inappropriate joke, it's, yeah, it can live on forever. And so if you think about uh, the difference, like in-person interaction if there's a problem, you make eye contact and you figure out how to deal with the awkwardness of I've offended you and I apologize in person and, um, 
it's a little bit more awkward to be in person. It, it's far easier to always be online and involved and connected through a mediated thing, through a screen. Uh, and it's easier, but then we don't, what we're seeing is it too easy. Teams aren't learning the skills of social interaction, direct connection, being able to talk to people face to face, make phone calls, talk to people, right? You combine this, so it's social media on smartphones with touch screens. That's the other sort of the, the trifecta of this. Because a touch screen allows you to immediately just touch, reach out and touch the screen and move on from anything that isn't immediately satisfying. And so touch screens are a way uh, to jump to the next media, to fast forward, whatever, in a way that doesn't happen with other ways of using technology. And so it's training us to have a very short attention span and not have the patience for the telling of, of stories that take longer, that takes longer to be, be in person, right? Um, what we're seeing is that the youngest generations amongst us are more likely to be anxious, depressed, and suffer from eating disorders. And, and the thing that is the strongest correlation with that is the rise of, of smartphones. Now, this is not to say, like in the same way, we didn't stop using combustion engines, right? We, we're not gonna stop using social media and, and smartphones. Like this, this sermon is gonna be posted on Facebook, on social media. Uh, I'm not going to get rid of my, my, my smartphone. Though there is a rising trend right now of uh, dumb phones is what they're called, what we would use, used to call flip phones um, or feature phones, right? Uh, there's a rising trend of dumb phones as more and more uh, people who are frankly younger than me are just don't want to deal with it anymore. But the technology isn't going away. So what we can change is how we, we use it. So here are some hopefully productive thoughts. We can encourage people to be present in person with each other, right? Think of those good things we thought about back in phase one of this sermon, right? eating together, putting the phones down and cooking together, creating music together. These are the activities that we can invite people to do with us. And, and, and this is something deeply evangelical, right? Evangel means good news. To say that we have the good news of knowing this is how we, as made in the image of God, we know how we are meant to be living, embodied with each other, spending time together, building community in person with eye contact and touch, and, and, and don't just tell someone I'm glad to see you, but give them a hug, and, and, and just an embodied living, right? Cultivating the ability to do things together to be in person, cultivating the ability to focus on something, helping people, because the, the risk of all the social media is a, a deep, uh, a lack of being rooted is one way to think about it. Because if you're rooted in people that you're living with, friends that will be there day after day, then you have a sense of connection, whereas online everything is ephemeral. And so what we can do with this just practically, uh, we can tame our own relationships with smartphones. Like, smartphones can give us 200, 300, 1,000 pings a day. Just get rid of all the notifications. If you need help knowing how, ask me. I'll show you how, right? For, for adults, um, we can choose uh, to be more present with each other. Like, the risk of using smartphones is we're always in the eternal elsewhere. We're always distracted. And if, if someone grabs their phone, other people grab their phone and just be the person, I'm not going to grab my phone when I'm talking to you because you are more, person. you the person in front of me is more important than anything else that's happening in, in this, whatever is online, right? To practice being present with the people in front of us. Um, eye contact, right? For, a, for those of us with connections with young people, as I said, invite them into our lives. This is not a problem that is solved using shame, right? We can't shame our way through this. Shame, in general, is just not a great idea. It doesn't tend to work. But we're not, I can't tell a teen, right, uh, that you shouldn't be using that smartphone. Like, it's not going to work. You shouldn't. What I can say is, this is really good. Would you like to drink some tea with me and tell me about this, this sports program you're involved in? Or this, what, what do you want to do with the youth program? It turns out that being involved in team sports or youth programs or scouting or, or things that get people together is a great way to inoculate teens against 
the damage that smartphones and social media and the ever-present connection can, can, damage, can happen. Uh, if nothing else, we can use technology in ways that is more focused on stories that require more attention over more time. I re wrote this sermon while my children are watching a Harry Potter movie in the next room over. And watching a Harry Potter movie requires attention over a period of time and it is far healthier for your brain than it is to be on YouTube for two hours, right? So like, they've read the Harry Potter books, they've watched the Harry Potter movie, and, and reading and watching a movie and watching a, a, a TV series, like those are more story driven and we can sit down and watch and engage with stories with people. And then the, it's all the short form stuff. It, that, that's where uh, it, it, the rewiring of the brain to be distracted is really more happening there. As a press, so talking about what we can do as adults, now let's talk about what teens, like where, where does that look like? We can advocate for phone-free schools, like actually phone-free, not just no phones in the classroom, just like no phones in the building, gone. And, and what happens when there, there are no phones in the, in the schools is they hear Teachers hear laughter in the hallway. People start laughing in the hallway again. Um, play with others, as I said, with teens being involved in groups of people together, embodied with people on a regular basis is just profoundly healthy and good. And, and then think very carefully about what we're going to do, how we're going to do uh, smartphones. Like the technology is there; it's going to happen. It's about protecting teens until. Uh, the brain get through puberty and the brains are developed, wired, uh, so that they have a good sense of self-worth and connection to people. And, and so wait on social media as long as possible. Uh, phone, buy a dumb phone or a flip phone, use that, or, or dramatically control the apps. That, that's what I'm looking into. You can get a smartphone and then dramatically control what apps are going to be on that phone, right? And, and this is, this has me pondering, like, I wonder what people felt like when they first realized that leaded gas was a problem. As I said, we can feel guilty or shame about this, the way that we, we, what we've stumbled into, but this is something we've only ever re really realized since 2012, 2013. It's been about a decade and we're now seeing this and we're kind of at an inflection point. Like we as Christians who believe that we are made body and spirit in the fullness and the goodness of life, that Jesus came so that we might have life and have it more abundantly, as Jesus put it, as he said, like we're, it's time not, it's not about guilt at this point, it's about saying we have a better way of life. And it looks like this, it looks embodied, it, it looks with each other, it looks beautiful, it looks like a set of practices that, that can help us as adults be more focused on each other and less distracted, but also help teens develop those same practices while their brains are, are developed so that we can live the good life to go, the, together the way that we were made to, to, to live. Thanks be to God. Amen.